This is Thrivecasters. Thriving, not surviving. Tackling youth issues that matter to you. We are joined here with some great people, obviously, because it's Thrivecasters and we're amazing. So we have Zakia in my left-hand corner. I don't know what corner that will be for you guys watching at home. Uh, we also have Anissa, who's in the middle for me. I don't know where she is on your screen. And then you also have me, Ashley, as well. So we're going to be your hosts for today, uh, talking about some stuff that is trending online, um, some major things that we've seen in articles across the internet that we want to discuss with you because we were just shocked at how it was written, at how the, the content of it, it was just wow. So yeah, so we're just going to introduce each other. So Zakia, do you like to start first and then we'll go to Anissa and then we'll go to me and then we'll go live into this article that we just read. Go for it. Hi, I'm Zakia. Um, I'm part of the Thrivecasters team. I'm currently doing my A-levels uh, and yeah, just wanted to be in this conversation because it was a little bit scary reading that article. Um, yeah, so really interested to hear what everyone's got to say on it. Uh, yeah, let's go to you, Anissa. Uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, yeah, so my name is Anissa. Um, I'm a last year um, English and Journalism student at Birmingham City University. Um, and yeah, when, like, likewise, even like from the perspective of a journalist, like looking at the article, it really shocked me. And being a student at the same time, because obviously Selly Oak is, um, has a large student population. So it, it really shocked me, the figures there and kind of the handling of the testing and tracing of COVID in general. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I suppose I'll introduce myself. So I'm Ashley. I'm a journalist and writer from Birmingham. Um, just recently kind of got this thing with Hello Magazine, doing my first byline nationally, which was great. Um, so seeing something like this was uh, a shock. <laughs> a shock that it's so it's so public and actually it's it's real and it's raw and it's happening, you know, all over the country. So it's scary stuff. Um, so that being said, what was your initial reaction? So just for you guys at home, we had uh, an uh, article sent through that is very, very shocking. So the headline reads, Selly Oak residents given used coronavirus test kits by mistake. So naturally my response was like, what? I know Zakia was like, huh? <laughs> so yeah, guys, tell us a little bit about your responses and how did it feel reading this headline and reading the actual article? What was it like? Um, I was just, it, 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 seems, it seems kind of absurd when the biggest national issue at the moment is coronavirus. One of the biggest issues that we've had throughout this crisis is getting enough testing and getting it all sorted. And I mean, I suppose we have to be thankful that it wasn't a bigger case because they said it was like 25. And yes, that's still, it's a big problem that they're kind of having such an obvious mistake as someone's used this test and we're just going to hand it to someone else now but I, th I think we also have to be a little bit grateful for the fact that it's 25 they caught on in five minutes and hopefully everything seems sorted and they, they seem to understand that it's a big deal but I think also it, they don't understand it's a big deal because this has been kind of kept a bit mm. there's no problem no panic mm. Mm. It's just, so yeah, I mean, I I totally agree with that. I feel like it's kind of, it's it's shocking and not shocking at the same time because you're like, you know, why on earth? How did that even happen, if you get what I mean? So like in a place where obviously we're getting, you know, in, in this day and age where we're constantly getting reassured by the government, by local council that, you know, they're, they're testing um, at the right capacity, um, at the right capacity and that they're doing everything in a very clinical way to then you know have such a big mistake I'm sorry I just don't think that's right and especially you know with in an area that's you know has a high concentration of students and as we know students are currently not having the best time with COVID in terms of being locked in their dorm accommodation sorry and being um tested for pos positive for coronavirus um, so I think there's just, there's a lot that's gone wrong here. And I just don't think it's just this. I think we need to look at the broader picture of the fact that students are not getting 
um, enough dialogue really about the test and tracing. They're not getting supported enough in in this in this whole pandemic. And I feel like now with like online learning as well, and you know how you know that's a whole issue issue as well. Speaking to a lot of students, so I think there's a wider picture that we need to to look at. So that's like my next question. So obviously you guys are, you know, university learning in that space. And it just feels like every time we go online, every time, you know, there's a new speech from Boris Johnson, it's attacking you in such a severe way. If it's not that you guys are going out and you're eating out to help out like everyone else was told to do, if it's not that you're going to university and you can't go home now because quote unquote, don't kill your gran, those things like that, how does that make you feel hearing that? Because they're targeting it at you. Like, I'm out of that bracket now, I'm good. But it's <laughs> you guys are there on a regular basis. How does that make you feel? I, I think it feels a little bit contradictory because, like, we're sort of, we're young, we're meant to be going outside, we're one of the biggest spending groups. So, in terms of contributing to the economy, which is becoming now the priority. So we've decided it's a health crisis and we've sort of sorted that out. The NHS isn't in trouble and now we've got to sort out the economy. But also we don't want you to go outside and help the economy. We want you to stay inside. You, you can almost like, there are sensible precautions that you can take and there are definitely groups of students who are not taking those precautions. But there's also a lot of students, like I've got a friend of mine who's at Kiel Uni and there's someone in her rooms who has been put into isolation, who's been using her kitchen, her bathroom, and that they haven't done anything about it. It's just she's gone in isolation and now she's stuck in within what, 10 feet of this girl with 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 no support. And she she avoided all of the freshers events that were sort of events that weren't happening but were happening. And yet she's still having to cope with the repercussions of it with no support like she's considering coming home now because she's got one lecture every what two three weeks so it's almost yes i can understand that there are some people who are not following the rules but for the people who are following the rules and who are doing their best to keep away from this issue why is it just being we're being poked at where's the justice in that so mm. I think I would I really agree with that. I mean, even the like the, the the language that's been used towards young people in particular and the fact that, you know, a lot of people focus on the negative that young people are doing or the, the you know, I hear so many people saying, oh, the, you know, a lot of students doing COVID parties and stuff like that. Although that's, you know, a small minority of young people who are doing that, a large majority of people that I know of, and I'm sure you guys know of as well, are following the rules. And I just feel like if 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 we're just going to focus on the negative rather than actually implementing um, the right dialogue between, for example, so if we're talking about Birmingham in particular, after what's happened today with with the with the used testing, I just feel like it's how can I say like the, just the, there is no dialogue. I, I think that's just what it is. Yeah. There is no dialogue between the council and the young people in order for them to feel supported. Even feeling supported is a big step within this pandemic because, you know, with mental health and dealing with a lot more than just, you know, they're studying and having to go through all of these things, then being in accommodation by themselves sometimes, it, it can really like get to a person. So I just feel, I just think feeling supported is the main, you know, priority. So then, how, how do you guys kind of navigate like this space now? Because like you said, you don't feel supported. You don't feel like you have enough information to kind of work out how to conduct yourself. So how are you guys doing that? Like, how are you, yeah, how are you kind of making your own guidelines in a sense? How does it work? Because obviously you're doing something great and you know, you're also social distancing, you're doing whatever you need to do to try and maintain this new normal. But I suppose the guidelines are so, they're so conflicting. Like yeah, <laughs> I honestly, I don't I don't I couldn't tell you what the guidelines are right now. I really couldn't. <laughs> I've I've just stuck with the most extreme things I've got, like masks on all the time, socially distancing, not going out unless I have to. Which to be quite honest, I couldn't even tell you if that's what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I, I didn't even know that there was 
like the 10 o'clock curfew and uh, the, the, my app told me or something it's it's really interesting actually because it kind of betrays the fact that there's like you remember that was it last week now when Boris Johnson got the statistics wrong for what's got what the restrictions are up north and it 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 wasn't even a surprise to me because I'm confused. Of course, he's confused. He's barely paying attention. And 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 by the way, Brexit's happening as well, which it's all going on under the radar. Because Do you remember Brexit? Oh my <laughs> gosh, that old little thing. <laughs> but that's still happening, and it comes up on the news sometimes. It it's really interesting to see this dynamic going on of local councils who who are basically saying we know what's going on in our area please let us do the things that we want to do and and government at the top going yeah but these restrictions th this is what we're doing so it's like yeah i mean even with the contradictory thing that you said like even mps within birmingham are con like they're 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 saying that um you know the restrictions that are getting implemented are not good so who do you actually like um how who do you turn to because it's just actually ridiculous because on one hand it's like okay follow these restrictions you know follow these rules but then on the other hand the people who are running these local councils and run, running these local areas are saying it's not a good thing so who exactly is saying the right thing it's just You've got Keir Starmer saying something completely different, and then there's the government advice, the scientific advice that everything's based off, apparently. They're saying something else as well. That we should go into national lockdown, so yeah. it just doesn't make sense. Like, I, yeah. It, it, it's so peculiar. And, and you almost... It sort of brings, I think, furthers this anarchy. Like, there's a lot of talk at the moment in politics about polarity, especially because the American elections are coming up. And there's this talk about polar politics. And at the moment, there's nothing more polar in a political situation than someone saying you should stay in your house for the next three weeks and someone going, no, go outside. It, it's just going to be really interesting to see what happens in terms of mm. when decisions eventually get made, because I can definitely see a sort of turning point within the next couple of weeks if the R value keeps going up where someone's going to go well we need to take more extreme measures like considerably more extreme measures so okay what can the government do to regain your trust because i feel like i don't trust the government i feel like they had their chance and then they failed and then they had the chance <laughs> again and then they failed again and it's like it's just a it's a reoccurring nightmare when I read these guidelines. So I suppose my first question is, yeah, how do the government regain our trust? And then also as well, after that, where are you getting your information from when it comes to the guidelines? Because there are so many different sources now and I'm thinking about the things that I'm using as well, but yeah. So we'll start off with the first question. What can the government do to regain your trust? You can answer that because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, I don't think anybody can answer that. I don't think even the own, I don't think the prime minister who leads this country who is part of the government <laughs> can answer that question. Um, if I'm, I, I don't have an answer to that question, but I think, di I've said it before, I think dialogue is key. I mean, actually telling people what, it, the thing is, there's just so many mixed messages and I feel, like you said, everything's contradicting each other and if there's one clear message and that the prime minister can stand by himself and not, you know, go back on it an hours later or a couple of days later, that would be great just to show a bit of uh, ownership to the actions, I think, that they're taking. Because um, it's hard. I can understand. I mean, I sympathise with all these politicians and... With the That's I've never thought I'd say it, but I, I sympathise, you know, with Boris a little bit because it's a difficult it's situation. Yeah, yeah, it's a really weird situation, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's quite an interesting one. Of like, for instance, when they released the track and trace app, and there was a lot of hoo ha about, oh, they're going to stalk us, they're surveilling us, they're watching our every move, which. You kind of sympathise with, and yeah, definitely there's a little bit of you that's kind of like, okay, so they're, they're watching everywhere I go, which is kind of the point of the app, but also I have a right to privacy. I have that individual liberty that is to be, that I suppose our society kind of stands for. So it's almost contradictory. And there are a lot of states 
in the Eastern world where that's not an issue. You have the track and trace program, and I think Singapore completely destroyed their corona system. What's the corona system? Their coronavirus. And then it came back because they then got rid of the quarantine. But it, the initial um, response, at least, was really effective. So it's almost a question of Boris Johnson has to pander to the fact that people are increasingly wanting to work as individuals. It's it's a really contradictory system in, t- in just in terms of social morals because people want to work individually. They want to decide what they're doing. And you've got somebody that's literally saying you can't go outside of your house, which I think is the original problem, trying to find a way to create a dialogue that says you still have the right to do what you want or simultaneously saying, no, you can't go outside your house. That That's already a bit of a, I think, a problem for a lot of people. And I can see where the problem comes in. But I think in terms of gaining trust, I don't think there's much of a good way to do it because there are going to be people who come out of this really screwed over. I, I, I think the unemployment rate now is like 4.3%. That's 4.3% yeah, yeah. of the workforce that is completely, it's just it, in the next couple of months is going to be completely no options. So regardless of how amazing their policies are, how much money they give out, however great their policies end up being, there is going to be somebody who is really upset and more than likely, it's going to be people who are in more vulnerable situations because they're the people who get screwed over time and time again. Mm-hmm. I, I can't see a way that there's going to like solve the health crisis and keep everybody feeling like the government actually gives it out. I think a lot of the a lot of the policies that they've put through at the moment have been more for immediate impact rather than long term impact. So you know, obviously, like the furlough scheme and then the eat out to help out thing. I feel like they've it, those things were primarily to put a short term impact. You know, to kind of satis- satisfy a large amount of people to th- say, oh, okay, the government's doing something or the government's reacting. You know you know trying to help in some sort of way but I feel like if they really want to make an impact like you said I think they need to start looking at people who are more um, further down you know in terms of society where people who are unemployed at the moment and people who are obviously vulnerable like you said and don't have a lot of you know people who maybe you know people who are on um, benefits at the moment and you know obviously it's them people who will essentially get screwed over so I think where they're looking they need to look in terms of you know people in that sector rather than you know doing stuff that just helps in the short term economically if that makes sense yeah that's actually something I haven't considered I think someone someone said it on I think it was have I got news for you or something it will point out that everyone really likes Rishi Sunak at the moment because Rishi Sunak is just handing out money and then it doesn't go well. We'll hand out some more money. And there's nothing particularly challenging about handing out people money. It's, sorry, handing out money yeah. to people. It's, it's, it's not less, actually. It's, it's just, yeah, we'll just we'll just increase the national debt a bit more. We'll, we'll just give people who money and, and give them no long term solutions like the they've extended the apprenticeship scheme. But if there are no businesses and nobody wants to take the risk of opening a business because we're going to go back into lockdown. So what can you do to facilitate the situation it mm-hmm. it's i suppose it's quite interesting that like there was a bit of anger i suppose in the musical community when in response to questions about people getting different jobs um which you seen like said um people aren't going to have the same jobs and, and and people were angry about that but then there's also an idea of well we need to have a little bit of flexibility in how we think about this we need to decide what is the priority here because there is a debate there is a conflict going on between the economic and the medical between do we try to keep these jobs in existence or do we try and put jobs in different places or do we just give up entirely and let the chips fall where they may i i think it's quite an interesting kind of i don't i'm glad i'm not the person who has to make that decision but i also think it's it's very telling that you have a government that's kind of prioritizing 
I, I don't know who they're prioritizing right now because there's there's definitely a feeling like they're not prioritizing the hospitality sector. I, I don't. I, I don't know who who do you think that they're prioritizing right now. I, I'm not sure actually if they know who they're prioritizing. Potentially, I was going to say businesses, but then I know a few that have fallen under like under in the cracks, so they're not actually getting what they need to get. I don't know whether they're supporting young people. I know that they've brought out this new universal credit thing where if you're in a certain bracket, they'll pay companies to basically take you on and give you minimum wage for 25 hours. Amazing. But what if you're not in those industries? What if you want to go down into the arts routes? What happens there? You know what I mean? What if the, the companies can't afford to bring you in? I don't know what that looks well, like. Think, yeah, well, I was going to say, I would think we know what's going to happen to people who are in the arts now, because obviously, like, they're asking them to retrain, essentially changing their whole job career, everything, and going into a completely different direction. I just, I honestly, I think people who are obviously musicians or, you know, um, in, in the art sector, obviously feel alienated now and I, I think mm. that's and that I think it's they're alienating a lot of people like categories like one by one you know I, I can remember at the beginning of the pandemic a lot of ethnic you know BAME people were alienated now the the you know people who are in the arts are becoming alienated so they've said change your job career but what have they said after that? So what was your opinion? Because we've all seen the pictures, hold tight Fatima. Like we've all seen the images of Fatima, who's a ballerina, who's now going to change into a cyber career. How do the two relate? I don't know. And then you've got other people as well across different sectors that are basically saying, come into cyber. What was that all about? It was all over the internet. People were making memes about it, making jokes about Fatima and what she's doing with her life now. What was <laughs> what was your opinion when you first saw these pictures? Um, I was first of all, I was shocked. <laughs> I was like, I was like, what? First of all, I was like, what is this about? Like, why? Why are you telling this like woman to go into some cyber thing that has no relation? No, why is it so? Just basically, what is this all about? That's what I was, and then I and then I did a bit more digging. I was like. I just, I didn't, I was like, how? I think how was my, you know, question basically. <laughs> I think it's kind of peculiar that, I think it's, it's really an interesting question because if you want to look at it on a wider, like we're talking about long-term thinking, if you want to look at it from like a hundred years back to now. What's a hundred years back from now? The 1900s. Um, so that's, okay, let's say 200 years back. Let me do some maths, hang on. <laughs> there's the industrial revolution and there's this huge moment where everyone goes from like, going to introduce some massive stereotypes, but everyone's working the fields and whatever to suddenly everyone's working in huge factories. And it almost feels like this is going to be another one where we shift from everybody working in factories to almost a u-turn so it used to be everyone worked from home and now we're going to go back to that and we're going to have a situation where working 100 people to a factory is no longer the norm and it's which i think it's i think it's just going to be that nobody wants to do that because there is a way that you do things and obviously if you if you work in an orchestra or something then that does you can't what do work in an orchestra from home doesn't work very well but there's also i think it's quite exciting almost that what has been quite a slow shift into more online shopping more distanced things anyway is gonna suddenly go really really quickly into unfortunately fatima might have to become a cyber <laughs> oh my god but i think it yeah, is quite I, interesting i was gonna say that it it's it's it, I I think it's an insensitive way to put out that a person needs to change their profession. I do think it's quite insensitive because the way that they've put a picture out and it, they've probably spent loads of money on that on that publicity thing that they've done there. Um, but I do think it's a reality that we have to face in a realistic way. It's like it's reality, and I think we do need to come face to face with that. Where you know if. If you do want to be be a musician, even with you know journalism, I want to be a journalist, but I you know I do have to think realistically, 
you know, a little bit. And, you know, I think it's, it's we have to confront it, especially being students. And if you want to lead the way for other younger people now, it's something that we have to keep in mind or maybe just keep it in the back of your mind that it might be something that you have to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think. It's just, it's just a peculiar situation. <laughs> this is, it's, yeah. I, it's, it's quite Sorry, go for it, um, Zakia. It's just, everyone, you remember at the beginning when everyone was saying unprecedented circumstances and there was just like <laughs> half a dozen memes just going through every day. Of yeah. just like, it reminded me of like when Theresa May was doing her campaign and she was like strong and stable, strong and stable, and then she just got memed. Because the, the government, yeah. it's almost like, what is, what are you supposed to do at the end of this? It's, it's it's such a weird situation and i think sometimes we expect our politicians to be superhuman yeah i mean yeah. They've, they've done their fair share of messing up but mm. also they're not superhuman that they, they can make mistakes and i think there comes a point where we need to cut them not a huge amount of slack because they're our elected officials they're meant to be better at, they're meant to be made for this job like just in the same way up someone is made to be a writer or you're meant to be a journalist they're made to be politicians so they're supposed to be good at this but i don't think there's any training for what you're supposed to do in a pand in a pandemic i don't but, think they have crash courses in that this is the thing though i think yes there's no crash course for this and this is like you said unprecedented even though i am going to ban that word at the end of the year <laughs> it's so much but at the same time, when you compare it to other countries, like I can't remember the um, name of the woman who's in New Zealand, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Oh, oh yeah, she had it so. Yeah, yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. And she's done such an amazing job. Even yeah. when COVID wow. decided to show its ugly face again, she still went back and defeated the virus. That is an achievement. <laughs> and I'm not mistaken; she had like a baby in her hand when she was doing it at the same time. Yeah, it's insane. Wow. Boris Johnson has had a child. Boris Johnson has. <laughs> You see what I'm trying to say? So what's the I difference? just thought about that and I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my question is like, there are different approaches to how people have handled this pandemic. As young people, what would you have done differently if you were in charge of the country? <laughs> I love that response. <laughs> I've got, um, I've got an idea. I'd probably put a lot of emphasis on grassroots support systems and support organisations. There is a lot of power that we can give to the people. And I feel like, you know, although, you know, COVID seems, you know, we can't see this virus. And I think that's what makes it a lot more harder. But we can give power to the people where within communities, we can set up um, COVID support people. I know they're doing that, but I'm, I'm struggling to see it. And I think that's the problem. You know, uh, I'd probably say that if I could do one thing differently, I'd probably say put more of the energy into grassroots community people who, um, you know, people you can just turn to with co any COVID questions that you have within your community. If that's in just a single, you know, area for like different areas in Birmingham, for example. So there's a place where you can just turn to for all kind of, you know, COVID support. I think that's probably say the, the key thing, um, which they're implementing now, but I think they should have done that at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think it would have done, a, there would have been a lot less the kind of contradictory statements and contradictory, um, you know, arguments and stuff. Yeah. I suppose I disagree a little bit because yes, I do think that we need local support, and I definitely think that in terms of just like showing people what to do and having someone that you can speak to somewhat face to face about an issue is really good. But at the same time, I do think I, I do think a lot of people felt a lot better about the what are the the daily briefings. Yeah, like at, at the beginning, definitely my my family were watching that every day, every other day, because like what they're saying isn't particularly material, but it's just the fact that there is a guy behind a podium who looks like what he knows what he's doing and is just saying things at us that we can believe in. And I think 
to some extent that would be undermined by a local organization that you're asking for support from in terms of things like I don't know, food banks and pin, uh, like directing them to different services I think that's a really good idea and I think sort of in the wave of looking after originally the, the illness I think a lot of sort of byproducts of going into lockdown or a pandemic were sort of overlooked like people having trouble sleeping unemployment the fact that there are so many more people grieving and mm. you can't even go to your your family's funeral mm. i think that's it, it like definitely for me that was kind of an issue because we as a family we had to make a decision about who would go to the funeral and that mm. that really it was really jarring because it it erodes sort of traditions and things that you do it, it takes those away from you that would have helped you but I, I do also think that there is a, an amount to which you you want things centralized at the top and you do want some things happening locally and I, th there was a way that that could have worked together mm -hmm. and I do think that we already had a problem before the pandemic of the government trying to control everything and then just getting it all wrong yeah so yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting you said about grieving. I think there's many different types of grieving. You can grieve for someone who's passed away. You can grieve for your career. You can grieve for your mental health. There's many things that have happened that people are, they're trying to cope with this new normal and they're going through the grief process, but they just don't know how to do it properly. So that being said, like in terms of the local organizations that are in Birmingham, that are in the Midlands, what, what do you think they could do to help people, young people, help the community in general, whether that be with job support, mental health, better messaging to try and get people more knowledgeable what's happening in the world. What do you think they could do to support people in their community? Um, I'd probably say um, employment's the biggest, obviously the biggest um, concern for young people. Um, new graduates, people who are in school right now studying to eventually get a job, which they don't know they'll get. So I think employment is, unemployment, I should say, and employment, is the most important issue and I'd probably say um and I think there's a there should be a big emphasis on this is like workshops um for young people on how to get a job maybe that's CV writing or how to uh, conduct themselves in an interview and and how to actually look for jobs because that's a that's a, a skill in itself so I think these kind of workshops will be really useful which are led you know could be led by local authorities, in fact, should be led by local authorities and organisations to actually get people into employment. I know you could, I know you could say that there's not enough jobs being produced, but I think just having those skills um, to actually find a job and how to look for one would be really useful. So yeah, I'd probably say that. I think that's an interesting one. I think it's kind of interesting that these. Like, for instance, when you have, um, if you have a baby, the your hospital knows that you're having a baby because you go for checkups and stuff. And then once the baby's born, you have almost two years, three years of support from the various agencies. They come in, they check that your house is OK for a baby. They check the weight of the baby. They give you breastfeeding advice. They give you like the entire plethora of this is how you raise a baby. And I find it a little bit kind of. I feel like that would be a good way of a kind of a similar system for how to get a job because that's that's essential as well but where's the support for that and in terms of like yes having workshops on how to write a cv how to go for applications what kind of job you should do the fact that those things aren't like a given is a little bit it feels like a a foregone conclusion and the fact that it's not there is is weird mm. i like that i like that analogy of the breastfeeding and like actually the nurturing is there and then once you you know you're on your third year it's like, okay now you're trained up enough, and you've got enough support to be on your own. 
<laughs> no, but that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So I think, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And in terms of the local authorities now, so the councils and different like bodies that are running the city and running the region, what can they do to help young people? Because I know you mentioned, Anissa, about workshops. That's an amazing idea. And I think actually, like you said, just that nurturing kind of program. I think to be fair, you've just built your own program. Workshop, <laughs> three-year workshops for people that are coming out of education. There you go. You've already made it. That's perfect. Well, yeah. What else do you think the authorities could do to help people in this situation, especially young people during the pandemic and empower them as well at the same time? I think I think they need to reach out because these I think like, I found the like so this is pre corona, but I was trying to find a job didn't really know how to go about it, didn't know where to apply and stuff. So I went to the council and said, what what can you do? What support can you offer me? And then I get given like a sheaf of leaflets, which I then have to sift through and find what actually is there. But th these things exist. They're just really difficult to get hold of. You have to know the right people to just get in the door to get a leaflet. So I think there's almost a responsibility from the council to rather than expecting people to come to them that they come to you and find people in the community who are in a difficult situation and because I don't want to say the data's out there but people go through the system so when they drop out the system some something must tag something must say well they're missing like you drop out of school someone's going to notice you have a certain amount of um, you go to the hospital for something that should that should flag up something and someone should something should trigger and say well now we will give you this intervention and it almost seems like once you've become an adult you're no longer a concern and it's just that's powerful to hear like seriously that's really really powerful yeah wow um, thank you for sharing that. That was that was really powerful. Um, Anissa, yeah, what's your what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I I I agree with everything that Zakia said. I mean, I think um, I think you know, young people, we we're I think we're we're very kind of straight with what we say and with what we speak. And if you're straight to us, we will get it. And I just feel like if you're transparent as well, you know, you've got to you've just got to be straight up with us and say okay, un, you know, unemployment is going to happen now because we're in a recession and we need to, you know, morale, morale needs to get, you know, we need to start motivating each other. And I feel like we don't do that enough with young people and with each other to just go and look for a job, you know, and trying to, and I think the, the local authorities need to do that, do that as well, where they they need to motivate us, motivate us young people because we take, you know it takes a lot for us to be motivated because of social media and the age we live in where we get the so many distractions but I just feel like we I think motivation is key and uh, I think if we try and motivate each other and try and look for a job and see you know that there's opportunities out there and make it accessible make it available for people who are from black Asian ethnic minorities and for everyone in between I think it will be you know that should be at the the forefront of you know at the moment with what's happening gen z has spoken you heard it here <laughs> first of all there great things about intervention workshops and actually taking care of the community in the way that they deserve love it you guys are amazing so these are my co-hosts we've got anisa we've got zakia thank you guys for listening and obviously what do you think as well listeners at home what do you actually think because this is a topic that's affecting everyone especially young people so what do you think have your say get in touch with us at thrivecasters on instagram so at at on point wm also for local organizations that are listening in come and have a conversation with us maybe you might have an idea or maybe you might be able to help us out with some of the ideas that were thrown out today get in touch with us and thank you for listening obviously we'll be back very very soon with another episode of Thrivecasters so we'll see you soon on the next one don't forget to follow us on social media on point wm and hashtag Thrivecasters join us next time for more conversations that matter to you